Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast, and if that's you, welcome home. Well, 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 True Crime Army, it's October, the spookiest month of the year, a time where people snuggle up in their fall sweaters, drinking pumpkin spice lattes and glühwein for those stationed in Europe, and where people sit and watch scary movies with hopes of having the crud scared out of them. But October is also a month to raise awareness of a different type of spooky, a topic that is taboo in many circles, a crime that occurs in the still of the night or right in front of everyone's eyes during an office holiday party, but everyone turns a blind eye. Yep, it's domestic abuse. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and for this case, I stepped a little bit outside of my comfort zone to bring you the rawest of details on the most gruesome murder I have told on this podcast. But unlike any other story I've told, I got the details for this story from the survivor herself, a woman by the name of Megan Hyatt. Join me today as I tell you about Megan's survival after a gruesome triple murder suicide that left her wishing she would have died as well, but then realizing she survived a tragic domestic violence assault so that she could help others get out of the hell that is domestic violence. Now, without further delay, let's dig in. My main source for today's story was Megan Hyatt herself, both a personal interview together, but also her TikTok, her Facebook, and her YouTube accounts. Additional sources include First Coast News, Action News, JAX, The Indie Star, The Navy Times, and Inside Edition. Megan Rose Hyatt was born on October 15, 1993. She was born to Travis and Melissa Hyatt, but Megan wasn't born alone. Nope, she was born a twin. Her brother's name is James Tyler, and the twins were inseparable. Megan was raised in Jacksonville, Florida, in a very religious household, She was a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, aka Mormon, and she admits that she had a pretty sheltered life. She didn't do the dating thing a lot, so she never really thought about evil the way that most of us true crime addicts do, you know, the whole trust no one mentality. She was very gullible. When Megan and Tyler were 12 years old, their parents decided to get a divorce, which was very tough for both kids. They tried to do the 50-50 thing with the parents, but after that got tough, Megan and Tyler had a preteen chat, a very difficult discussion. They decided that they would approach their parents with an idea. They wanted to live with their dad. They thought it would give them more stability with school and everything else. And so that's what they did. Megan admits to me that she was always a daddy's girl. So it was not a surprise when she wanted to live with her father. Fast forward a couple of years, when Megan was 20 years old, she created an online dating account on the Plenty of Fish website. She soon met a Navy man by the name of Gawain Rasheen Wilson. Now I'm gonna call him Rush for the remainder of this episode because that was his nickname. He was in his late twenties and he had already served seven years in the Navy by the time that they met. And he seemed very stable. In the Navy, he served as an aircraft engine mechanic. According to his online dating profile, he was half Jamaican and half British, although he identified mostly with his Jamaican half. He was born in the Caribbean and spent most of his life between England, Chicago, New York, and Florida. He considered himself a very caring, passionate, and ambitious person, and he was very proud to own his house, two cars, and a motorcycle. According to his profile, he was looking for a woman who could be a girly girl but also a woman who wasn't afraid to put her hair back and jump on his motorcycle with him. He acknowledged that he was not the best man in the world, but he considered himself above average. Megan was impressed with what she saw. Rush was tall, he was six foot three. He was lean, dark, and handsome. 
after they made a connection online, they decided to meet in person. It was late night and Megan had just gotten off of her shift at work and Rush told her that they could meet then. Megan knew that Rush was busy working the graveyard shift at the Mayport Naval Air Station, so she was a bit confused. Rush told her not to worry and instructed her where to meet. He told her that he'd send someone for her. It was a rainy night and Megan had butterflies in her tummy. She didn't know what to expect, but like she told me, she was young and naive. She went to the location and she parked her car and one of Rush's sailor friends picked up Megan and took her onto the military base. Megan went to a building not too far from the helicopter hangars. In fact, it could have been a helicopter hangar. And she met Rush for the first time. It was June 8th, 2014. There, they had their first impromptu date. They talked for hours and Rush showed her around the helicopter hangar where a few helos were parked. He even let her walk in one and walk around it. Megan loving every minute of this experience. A military man was into her. She was thrilled over the moon. And he was legit, you know, not a serial killer at all, she thought. The military wouldn't let crazy people into their ranks, right? After seven hours of hamming it up, Rush's shift was over and he drove her back to where she had parked her car. She got into her car, but crap, her battery was dead. Rush was not going to leave his new girl stranded. So according to Megan, he moved the earth in the sky to help her with her car, including bringing her back to his place where he made arrangements for the car. The car battery was a blessing in disguise, though, because they ended up spending another few hours together. And by the time she left him, it was time for another shift at her job. Megan was smitten. From then on, the relationship progressed at military speed. Within two months of dating, Megan and Rush had moved in together. While Megan was sad to leave her dad's place as she had no complaints, she was ready to be out on her own, to feel like an independent woman. And Rush was just what she needed. He was established in his military career. It was great. And like sometimes happens, the relationship moved so quickly that by October of that year, she found herself pregnant with twin girls. What? By this point, Megan had just turned 21. And while the idea was scary as all hell, she knew that they would make it work. Meanwhile, December of 2014 rolled around and Rush had to leave for a month because he was getting some sort of surgery on his leg or his thigh. You see, earlier that year in February of 2014, just a few months before meeting Megan, Rush told Megan that he was in a relationship with a crazy woman who shot him in the leg. Megan thought that was awful. What a lunatic to shoot a man. Shoot, she's crazy. So off Rush went to get this follow up surgery. Rush returned and by January of 2015, Megan began to notice that the relationship wasn't as perfect as she had once thought. On one random night while Megan slept, Rush woke her up at three in the morning and began to scream at her in her face. He told her that she was fat and ugly and that no one would ever love her. He berated her and quite frankly, scared the crud out of her. Mind you, by this point, she was a few months pregnant with his twins. Soon thereafter, she decided it was time for her to leave. So she packed it up and she returned to her father's house. And almost as soon as she left, Rush, the control freak, wanted Megan back. So they began to talk again and he promised to the moon and back that he would change, that he overreacted and that she was great. And then he made a gesture that Megan thought he'd never make. He invited her on a Valentine's Day date. You see, while the relationship was still peachy, Rush had confided in Megan that he hated Valentine's Day and he would never, ever, ever celebrate the romantic holiday ever again. He told her that he had previously been married and on Valentine's Day one year, his wife walked out on him. So this year, the fact that now Rush was going back on his promise to never ever celebrate Valentine's Day again, that meant a lot to Megan because she had never been in a serious relationship besides Rush and she had never actually had a Valentine's Day date. And with that, he won her back over and Megan moved back in. During this time, Rush had his 13-year-old sister move in with the couple, and this caused some strain in the young relationship. Rush was very strict with his sister, and she couldn't really do anything outside of going and coming from school. Megan was pregnant with twins, and she was placed on bed rest pretty early on due to a high-risk pregnancy. The sister would ask Megan for permission to do stuff, but Megan couldn't 
go against Russia's orders, so it just sucked. And Megan recalls that there was no real reason for the sister to be living with them. Russia's mother, who lived in New York at the time, was perfectly capable of raising the kid. Well, after an entirely complicated pregnancy at 33 weeks pregnant, Megan was admitted into the hospital and ready or not, the baby girls were coming. Hayden Rose and Caden Reese were born prematurely on June 8th, 2015, a full year after Megan and Rush had their first date. They were beautiful. And because of how small and fragile they were, they were in the NICU. Megan, the young mom, had delivered in a hospital that had a 24-7 NICU. So Megan planned to basically hunker down with the girls. But this soon became an item of contention for Rush. He was pissed that Megan was spending every waking moment and sleeping moment with the girls. He thought her place was at home with him. He figured the girls were fine since they had nurses to tend to them 24-7. After some arguments, Megan left the hospital, although her heart stayed in the NICU. Within a week of the girl's birth, Rush's mom came to visit. Now, Megan explains that the NICU that Reese and Rose were in was a no kids allowed NICU. And I believe that you had to be 16 years or older to enter. Megan was somewhat of a rule follower and she became slightly ticked when Rush lied to the nurses about his sister's age to allow her to come in. Remember, she was 13 years old. Megan, the protective young mom, remembers the young sister being really touchy feely with the babies as young kids sometimes are. And this kind of annoyed Megan. In retrospect, she realizes that she was just being a young protective mother. But in that moment, she was cringing on the inside. The nurses must have sensed that Megan was anxious because they came to check on her. And this checking on her really seemed to bother Rush's mom, who became really annoyed. Like, why did they have to come check on you? Is it because we're black? Now, I hadn't mentioned this earlier, but... Rush it was black and Megan was white. And Megan told me that she always felt like her race and his race were always uh, a point of contention with his family. Now, this statement by the mom caused Megan and the mom to kind of get into an argument in the NICU. Rush then stepped in and began to get upset with Megan. And the argument soon escalated into a loud and rambunctious family ordeal in the middle of the NICU. So the nurses called security and they came in and they escorted Rush, his mother and his sister out. All the while, Rush was pissed and he threatened everyone and their mama, including the nurses. Rush told Megan that she was no longer welcomed in his home and that he would soon be signing his parental rights over because he didn't want to be financially responsible for those girls. Megan was so embarrassed. She was a week shy of having delivered her babies and now she was homeless. And with what Rush yelled on his way out, she felt that her girls were fatherless. And within hours when Megan tried to use her phone, it stopped working. You see, Megan had a phone that was under Rush's cell phone plan and he was so tiffed that as soon as he got home from the hospital that day, he disconnected her phone, cutting off all her means of communication. Megan was devastated. She called her mom crying and told her what happened. And her mom assured her that her and the girls would always have a place to stay. Melissa, Megan's mom, picked her up and they went to the store to pick up a few things that could tide Megan over and make her feel comfortable in the hospital while she stayed with the girls in the NICU. The NICU nurses approached Megan with pamphlets and information about domestic abuse, but Megan just shrugged it off. She did not believe that what she was going through was domestic violence. He had never actually placed his hands on her, so she thought that she was in the clear. Within a week and a half, after not being able to contact Megan because he took her cell phone privileges away, Rush called Megan's father to ask to speak to Megan. And with that, he asked for permission to come see the girls. He had previously been banned and was only allowed into the NICU with Megan's permission because of his little scandal. Megan was unsure what to do, but after Rush sweet-talked her some more, she agreed to let him come see the girls. And when he came, he was all nice and gentle. Reese was the first baby to be released from the NICU and she went home with Rush and Megan, who by now had moved back in with Rush after various promises that he was going to change. 
In fact, he even took a domestic violence awareness course through the Navy, which I later learned was like a one hour course. So really it wasn't beneficial to him. And you'll see why I say that later. While at the time, Megan didn't believe that she was a victim of domestic violence because Rush never placed his hands on her per se, she now realizes that domestic violence can be physical, emotional, and sexual. And it's at this point that Rush continues his reign of terror, even though he promised he was going to change. After the girls were born, he got worse. During arguments, he threw a tablet and threw a table at Megan. He'd force Megan to have sex with him after she told him multiple times no. He'd hold down her arms and on a few occasions, she woke up to him having sex with her. It was now August of 2015 and one of Russia's Navy friends was having a baby shower. Megan wasn't really ultra social and in plus, the protective mom didn't want to bring twins to a baby shower where all the grown germy adults would want to hug and kiss the girls. So she made an excuse and stayed home. Rush went to the shower with his mom and his sister, and when he returned, he was shocked at what he saw. Megan and the girls were gone. She had decided to leave him. And well, the cycle began again. Rush begged for forgiveness. He promised that he'd change, and Megan was stuck with her own fears, not being able to provide for the girls without him, not wanting her girls to have to split their time 50-50 like her and her brother had to do before they decided to live with their dad. Megan had guilt if she stayed, but she had guilt if she left. So after Rush spent about a month courting her and the girls again, attending church with Megan and her family, Megan made a decision. She decided to move back in with Rush. When she returned to the house again, the living situation is awkward to say the least. Rush's mom and sister are still at the house. And after the NICU fiasco, Things were not looking too good for, the, for them to be all living together. Eventually, though, Megan convinced Rush that in order for them to work out their issues, his mom and sister had to go. So it was settled and the mom and sister left. And soon it was just Rush, Megan, Rose and Reese. And the cycle began again. But this time, what broke the camel's back was when Rush forced Megan to have sex with him against her will And then while he was having sex with her, he grabbed her phone and FaceTimed her dad in an ultimate effort to humiliate her. Megan was able to grab the phone and throw it, but she was mortified. After experiencing that moment of pure humiliation, Megan shared that part of her relationship, the sexual abuse part that she hadn't shared with anyone, with her father, Travis. And when she told him, he cried. Travis wasn't dumb, though. He knew something was up before she told him and he had Googled it. He told Megan that he thought she was a victim of domestic violence. And while Megan wasn't completely sure that he was right, she agreed with him that she had to get out and they came up with a plan. Megan wanted time to gather some boxes and pack up some things. And the following week would be good because Rush was on duty and Travis and Megan's friend could come over and help her with the girls and help her pack. and. Travis and Megan left it at that. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up. No more shady business. 
Rituals Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. Two days before the scheduled move, Megan asked Rush to use his phone to transfer some pictures from his phone to her phone, and she did. While she had the phone, she admits that she began to snoop. And lo and behold, she found that Rush had been chatting with other women on his Plenty of Fish dating account. Megan was livid, but she said nothing. The day was November 13th, 2015, and Travis had come home with his truck to help Megan and the girls move. Megan knew that the stuff in the girls wouldn't fit in the truck, so she enlisted her friend Sarah to come and take the girls in her car. At about 2.30 p.m. while she was packing, Megan made a decision that would change the course of her life forever. She called Rush and told him that she was leaving him. And this time was the last time she did not intend to come back. Megan assured Rush that he could always see his girls whenever he wanted. But Rush was irate on the phone. Megan was a little surprised at the words coming out of his mouth, especially because he was at work on duty. By the way, by this point, Rush had been transferred from the base that he met her at a year earlier, Mayport, and he was now stationed at NAS Jax. Megan was trying to reassure Rush over the phone that she wouldn't leave until he got home from work and could kiss the girls goodbye. But Megan secretly had no intention of being around when he got home, especially after hearing some of the things that he was saying. She just had a weird feeling about it. But she somehow felt safe telling him while he was at work because she figured that he wouldn't be able to leave before his shift ended. Rush, however, yelled in the phone that he was going to kill her and he filled the gaps with lots of profanity. Megan then heard another sailor tell Rush, come on, man, get off the phone. And then the call ended. Megan was shook, so much so that she went to her dad and told him everything that was said and she said, we should call the police. Travis assured Megan that this was not necessary. And after second thought, Megan opined out loud, quote, you're right, dad. He's never hit me before, end quote. Travis continued to pack the truck while Sarah attended to one of the girls and Megan attended to the other baby. Then, without warning, exactly 30 minutes after the call with Rush ended, in walked an irate Rush. It was about 3 p.m., Rush and Megan argued back and forth while the girls cried because it was past their feeding time. Megan tried to defuse the situation by asking Rush for his help feeding the girls. Megan was carrying one of the girls, but she went outside to grab the other twin who Sarah was holding. Sarah was reluctant and she didn't want to hand over the baby, but Megan was like, come on, everything is going to be fine. Megan then asked her dad to step outside while Rush and her spoke. 
and Travis told Megan that he would be outside if she needed anything. Megan and Rush talked while they were feeding the babies. Megan had Rose and Rush had Reese. But Megan could tell that Rush was upset. He was physically shaking. She described to me that he was shaking so uncontrollably while he was feeding the baby that he had the bottle in the baby's mouth and it kept coming out of the baby's mouth because he was shaking so hard. While they talked, he begged her to stay, but Megan had made up her mind. This was it. She was leaving and she wasn't coming back. Rush then asked, quote, that's it? This is it? End quote. And Megan responded with, yes, we're done. It's over, over. Rush then jumped out of the seat as he slammed the baby on the couch. He then closed the front door that had remained opened after Travis left as he walked over to their coat closet. Rush told Megan, quote, I'll show you what over means, end quote. He then retrieved a fully loaded AR-15 weapon. At this point, Megan was holding both girls and she was freaking out. Travis and Sarah were outside and Rush told Megan, you are going to watch me kill your dad. Megan, not knowing what else to do, yelled, dad, don't come in, don't come in. But ever the protective dad, Travis came rushing into the house. And as soon as he did, Rush riddled his body with gunshots. Travis quickly fell to the ground. But Travis wasn't dead and he continued to get up in an effort to save the girls. He thought if Rush expended all of his bullets on him, the girls might have a chance to escape. But the gun seemed to never be empty because once Travis stopped resisting, Rush walked right up to Megan and executed both of his five-month-old daughters with one gunshot to the back of their tiny little heads. He then riddled Megan with bullets right in her center mass. Rush then turned his attention back to Travis, shooting him again. Then he returned to Megan, shooting her a total of seven times. Megan, however, was not dead, although she played dead, realizing that if she continued to resist, he would keep shooting. The entire time, Megan was thinking, how did we get to this point? How did we get here? How and why did Gawain do this to my family? Rush then looked around, went outside, shot his gun a few times, returned inside. Assuming everyone was dead, he pointed the gun at himself and pulled the trigger, his body dropping to the floor with a loud thump. Megan could hear her dad was still breathing, and as she heard Rush gurgling on his own blood, she realized that she could move. One of Megan's eyes had been shot out of its socket and was literally hanging on her face. Her leg had been shattered in multiple places, and as she moved, she could hear her legs crunching. She didn't have her phone, but from across the room, she saw her dad's phone. She did this but scoot over to where her dad was laying as she apologized profusely for causing this mess. Travis, still alive, told her it wasn't her fault. He told her how much he loved her and promised her that when he died, he'd watch after the girls in heaven, since they both already knew that Rose and Reese were dead. Travis told Megan to tell her brother James how much he loved him. Megan tried to put her body weight on her dad to keep him from bleeding out, but she didn't have enough strength to pull herself up. She was able to get to his phone and in a moment of panic, she couldn't figure out his password, but she quickly remembered her dad was a simple man and his password was 1111. She punched in the number and dialed 911, but then as she looked at the phone and saw that it was ringing and someone answered, she couldn't hear a thing. Had she lost her hearing? Uh, not possible. She was just chatting with her dad. Well, then she realized that her dad had his earpiece on and she was able to grab one and talk to the 911 operator. While I was not able to get my hands on the 911 call, except to hear a snippet that was played on a few news channels, I was able to get my hands on the transcript. Megan told the dispatcher that her boyfriend shot her, her twins, her dad, and her best friend. She pleaded, please come, please come, ever so calmly. She told the operator to please come, and then she shared that the perpetrator had shot himself. What Megan didn't realize is that her best friend had not actually been shot. She had escaped to a neighbor's house and had already called 911. 
so they were on their way. While Megan was on the phone with the operator, her front door was still open from when her dad had walked in and Megan could see the first responders pull to the front of the house, but then she saw them leave. Megan was internally freaking out as she realized they still thought there was an armed person inside, but she shouted, please help, please help. The police then walked up to the front door with their guns drawn, and I'm assuming that they walked into the most gruesome scene ever. But before they could tend to Megan, they had to clear the entire house. Once they arrived, though, Megan knew that she might actually make it, although she wasn't sure that she wanted to survive this tragedy. Megan recalls the rest of it going at the speed of light. She was placed on a tarp, taken in the ambulance, and she spent the next 24 hours in two separate surgeries, each one lasting over a dozen or so hours. Meanwhile, all of this is happening and her mom and her brother had been in Daytona shopping for the day. When halfway through their shopping trip, Melissa, Megan's mom, just stopped in her tracks and told James they needed to go. She's not sure why, but she just wanted to start heading back home. On the drive, James was playing on his cell phone when he started to hear reporting about a shooting in his sister's neighborhood. The two of them panicked because they knew that Travis was at Megan's house that day helping her move. So then they began to call Megan and Travis nonstop. And no one answered. They just knew in that moment that something terrible had happened. But Megan shared with me that they had assumed that Travis and Megan had been killed. They had no idea that Rush was capable of turning the gun on his own two little babies. Melissa and James went to Megan's house and all the yellow tape was up. News trucks and reporters were lining the streets and neighbors were all surrounding the house. Melissa pushed her way to the front and started to pepper the cops with questions. And all she was told was that there was only one survivor. Melissa fell to the ground. Doctors did not believe that Megan would make it through that first night, but the girl is a freaking fighter. Once she survived, doctors told her that she would never walk again, but she did. She continues to defy everything that doctors say, but the road to recovery has not been easy. Throughout the following five years, Megan Hyatt underwent over 25 surgeries in an attempt to return her life to some form of normalcy. After the attack, she lost eyesight in one of her eyes, but she did end up getting a prosthetic eye. But here is Megan herself to tell you about the injuries she sustained on that frightful day. So I was shot in the face. A bullet went through my right eyelid, broke my nose and into my left eyelid. As a result, I lost my left eye. I now have a prosthetic eye. Um, I was shot in the left wrist. I was shot in the right breast. I have two areas in my abdomen where I was shot. I was also shot in my right leg. But as far as the abdomen goes, I lost part of my liver, a third of my liver. Um, My kidneys were damaged. I had an appendectomy, so my appendix is out. I lost part of my pancreas and part of my gallbladder. I lost part of my large intestine and small intestine, and my colon had to be rerouted. The only surgeries I have now are on my left leg. I had an amazing, amazing trauma orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Helms at Shands in Jacksonville. And he was able to get me to a point where I could be functional. And then um, due to just a contractor in the leg, which just means like you can't straighten your leg all the way because it's like the muscles tight in the back. Um, I had to have surgery again. And now that I'm in um, that Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, I have Dr. Nana who is doing so many things and Dr. Garrett we were doing so many things to get my leg to look more aesthetically pleasing to the eye as far as like removing skin grafts and making re- reducing scars that are giant, um, gigantic. And I did have a surgery. I've had three surgeries in the last 
three months. I had one on July 20th or July 17th, one on August 20th, and then I had one last um, Friday, October 9th. While her physical injuries have begun to heal, something that domestic violence survivors often don't talk about is the mental and emotional trauma afterwards. Megan experienced some intense post-traumatic stress after witnessing her father and two baby girls be murdered. Mind you, she was holding the two little girls while they were murdered. She had close to 30 nightmares a week and traditional therapy just didn't work for her. She attempted something called MNRI therapy. And while she thought it was just some voodoo magic, she figured she had nothing to lose. MNRI, by the way, stands for Mascotova Neurosensor Motor Reflex Integration. And when she did it consistently, it worked. I had to look it up. And according to First Action News, MNRI is when a therapist sends signals to the brain through the tendons. It's an attempt to reprogram the brain and to turn off the never ending alarms in the brain of someone suffering from PTSD. Sadly, Megan shared that after the murder suicide, her phone rang nonstop. But it wasn't always calls to give condolences. Sometimes, many times, for at least the first six months, it was people associated with Rush, family members that called to harass Megan. Yup. I was shocked when she told me this. Like, girl, are you serious? She said that her family and her would post things on Facebook about her progress and about the case, only to be attacked and threatened on social media. So it was as if even in death, Rush continued to harass and belittle the woman who he basically stole everything from. How traumatizing. Sadly, after the incident, Megan learned that Rush had a violent past. Remember that crazy ex-girlfriend who shot him in the leg? Well, it turns out that she was also living with Rush at the time and she decided to leave him. But she knew that he had violent tendencies, so she came armed with a gun. As she was attempting to leave, Rush attacked her and they fell to the floor, where the woman was able to get her hands on the gun and the trigger, shooting him in the leg. According to Megan, the woman was initially charged with attempted murder, but the charge was later dropped and apparently Rush was never charged with a crime for that incident. According to the Indie Star, Rush's criminal history goes back even further. Daniel Johnson, one of Rush's victims, spoke out and felt partly to blame for Megan's predicament. Daniel had met Rush on an online dating website in 2012. They ended up moving in together and soon began to have similar issues. There were warning signs everywhere. Rush began controlling Daniel's every move. Then he became jealous about everything. And finally, he became violent. And then it all culminated in April of 2013, when according to the Indie Star, Daniel was done with his crap. On this particular occasion, when they woke up, Rush was trying to initiate sex with the woman. When she said no, he grabbed her by the neck and threw her on the bed. When she attempted to grab her phone to call 911, he broke Danielle's phone and then put a gun right between her eyes. Rush was arrested for domestic violence. And while he was like, yep, I broke her phone, he didn't admit to putting the gun to her head. Rush had been arrested for a strangulation. He pled no contest to the felony and was sentenced to time served and probation. Seven months after the strangulation, a woman filed a restraining order for dating violence. Megan has learned that the Navy was aware of Rush's violent tendencies, but it has never been revealed what, if anything, the Navy did to help Rush work through his issues, besides maybe forcing him to take a one-hour domestic violence course, which is laughable considering what Rush ended up doing in the end. Megan just turned 27 years old last week, and when I asked her about her plans for the future, she told me she just wants to continue working to share her story and she wants to help other victims of domestic violence. She thought she met her Prince Charming and he was really an online date from hell. When I asked Megan if she was willing to chat with me, she looked up the podcast and surprisingly, even with everything that she went through, she told me that she was surprised that I had enough stories to have a weekly podcast. It's sad, but these stories are not rare and it's our responsibility to share them, to warn people. 
Clearly, in the current case, there were warning signs all over the place. And Megan confided in me that she felt more comfortable with Rush because he was a military man. Megan and her mom sued the Navy for pain and suffering and requested medical expenses. They argued that the Navy had a duty to warn her when they heard the conversation where he threatened to kill her over the phone, yet they still let him leave before his shift was over. She argued that they should have called her to let her know he was on the way. But, you know, we know that going up against the man is tough and the case was dismissed, stating, quote, that a party had no legal duty to control the conduct of a third party to prevent that person from causing harm to another, end quote. Well, everyone, Megan is an open book on social media. I encourage anyone who wants to follow Megan on her journey to recovery to follow her there. She can be found on TikTok and Instagram at No More Silence 2015. And she's on Facebook at Megan Rose Hyatt. And Hyatt is spelled H I A double T. There on her social media, you can see videos of her walking for the first time after doctors told her that she'd never walk again. You can also see videos of Rush during some of the good times. He's goo goo gaga over his little babies. And you can also catch a glimpse of Rose and Reese and their little tiny chubby cheeks. Megan has given a few speeches educating people on the dangers of domestic violence, and she always gives three signs to look out for when considering if you are in fact in a domestic violence situation. And here they are. She says, look out for someone who is short-tempered and loses their crap over little things. For example, Rush would expect dinner on the table at a specific time, and if it was not ready by then, he would flip a lid. Sign number two, someone who is extremely apologetic after blowing up and promises the moon and the stars that they will change. Sign number three, someone who is always hypercritical. Megan admits that Rush ridiculed her at home, calling her fat and even questioning her three days after giving birth about when she intended to lose the baby weight. He also always expected her to be dressed up and wearing makeup when she left the house. And you know, at the time, Megan just thought that he was making a woman out of her, never realizing this was part of his controlling nature. Megan always gets asked this one question, why did you always go back? And Megan recognizes that victims are so manipulated by that one person that when they do move out, the victim is so disconnected from the outside world that they feel like they have no one else and it's an easy decision to just go back. So Megan encourages friends and families to never give up on these victims because when they leave, they're gonna need that support. Megan believes that God spared her life for a reason, to share her story. She told me that her story helped at least one victim of domestic violence almost right away. One of her nurses was secretly suffering with an abuser at home. And when she saw what domestic violence could become, the nurse went home and left her abuser. Sadly, statistics prove that the most dangerous time for a domestic violence survivor is when they make the decision to leave and through the following year. Everyone thinks it's super simple to just pack your stuff and leave, but it's not because once the person leaves, they have to watch their backs all the time. So it's important to have a plan. Have a plan, have a plan. Megan now advises people to leave everything, leave everything behind and just leave when you can. You can replace belongings, but you can't replace people. Domestic violence is a worldwide pandemic, y'all. And now while going through the COVID pandemic, These victims are suffering home alone without that eight to 10 hour break of separation from their abuser. If you or someone you know are in a domestic violence situation involving any type of abuse, not just physical, there are people out there waiting 24 seven to help. You can reach out to the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-CARE. That's 1-800-799-722. Three, three. It's never too late to get help. Mm-hmm. 
I will be releasing portions of my interview with Megan in my fan club as an audio extra. So make sure that you head on over to patreon.com slash military murder to see how you can take a listen today. You can find me on social on Instagram at military murder podcast and on Facebook at military true crime. All right. I want to take a minute to acknowledge my newest dotted line fan club supporters. Shout outs here for these lovely, lovely people. Shout out to Deb P, Susan M, Cynthia S, Julianne A, Elva P, Whitney G, Barbara J, and Yasmin G. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with all of my boot camp and higher fan club members. This week's new assistant producer is Ashley H and my new associate producer is Alyssa D. Executive producer is Falcon 13. And as always, the music was created by Tyops. True Crime Army, this was a very, very heavy topic. It always is. But it's important that we keep our eyes peeled. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast.